So now let's start with antipsychotics. What's the mode of action? How do they work? They antagonize the D2 receptors in the brain. This is important for you to remember. Now you might be asking that Wahab, I can read this in a book. I can go anywhere, watch any video and understand they antagonize the D2 receptors. But why D2 receptors? That's a really nice question. And that's what I wanted to ask. So there's, there's this phenomena that in research has been associated with schizophrenic patients, patients exposed, patients predisposed to particular type of psychiatric conditions such as treatment resistant depression, uh, such as bulimia nervosa, anorexia nervosa, uh, such as uh, bipolar disorders in all of these patients. And these are also in, uh, indications, a lot of these are indications for antipsychotics that a D2 receptor upregulation has been seen in these patients. Therefore, there's in these schizophrenic patients, there's a dopamine hypersensitivity kind of thing. So if the receptors are upregulated with the smallest amount of dopamine, you could have a huge response. This is why we give D2 receptor antagonists in uh, psychotic disorders, disorders such as schizophrenia. So let's start with the first generation antipsychotics. So antipsychotics are divided into first generation and second generation. Second, first generation is then further divided into high potency and low potency. Examples of high potency include haloperidol, flufenazine, trifluperazine. So how, how I remember these is that uh, haloperidol is high potency, both start with H, and flufenazine and fluperazine I remember by when, when you get a flu, it highly affects your life for a day or two. When you get a flu, it highly affects your life for a day or two. This is how you remember high potency drugs. And then we have low potency drugs such as chlorparazine. So chlorparazine has low and then thio, uh, thioridazine, you cannot just, you're going to have to remember. So basic concepts, you need to remember this before we start. First generation antipsychotics treat only positive symptoms. They do not treat the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. You're going to have to look the negative symptoms of schizophrenia up. There are some things like apathy and flat affect. Apathy is when the person does not respond to stimulus as much as they used to. And flat affect is when the face or the person's normal demeanor seems completely expressionless. So first generation antipsychotics treat only positive symptoms. First generation is further divided into high potency and low potency. So the mode of action, high potency, antidopaminergic, low potency is antidopaminergic with also some anticholinergic and antihistaminergic effects. What do these mean? So anticholinergic, meaning your parasympathetic innervation, this is going to antagonize that. Histaminergic effects, patient might be more predisposed to sedation and things like that. EPS more common. I've used EPS here just to fit in the table. EPS means extrapyramidal symptoms. We're going to talk about extrapyramidal symptoms. What are they? And extrapyramidal symptoms are less common in low potency drugs. So let's talk about extrapyramidal system and what are exactly extrapyramidal symptoms and what are the pyramidal tracks just in a little bit detail. What's the, what are the pyramidal tracts? Pyramidal tracts include the cortical bulbar tracts. What's the cortical bulbar tract and why I uh, angle toward my face is because it includes all of the cranial nerves. All of the cranial nerve tracts are included in the pyramidal tracts. What else besides that? Voluntary movement. If I want to move my right hand or my right foot, that is included in pyramidal tracts. That's the corticospinal tract to be exact anything besides that. So I want to sit upright right now. For that, I will have to maintain a tone or posture in a lot of uh, my other muscles, my back muscles. So what's responsible for that? That is the extra pyramidal symptoms. And not only that, to initiate movement, to start the movement, these extra pyramidal symptoms, these extra pyramidal system becomes important. They, so they initiate the movement and they maintain the tone, the posture, and the movements that occur automatically in your body. Extrapyramidal symptoms. We're going to talk about extrapyramidal symptoms. But before we start with that, I need you to remember ADAPT. A-D-A-P-T. Let's start with extrapyramidal symptoms. ADAPT is the mnemonic I wanted you to remember. So I'm going to point towards my neck now, starting with acute dystonia. 
why towards my neck uh, towards my neck is because dystonia is like it says is something wrong with the tone of the muscle is something wrong with the sustained contraction of the muscle so the person might be having a sustained contraction of their neck which is known as torticollis so they have this sustained or transient contraction of their neck which is which can be extremely disruptive extremely uh, painful and uh, disruptive for the patient this is an example of torticollis or acute dystonia then the next a is akathisia what is akathisia when the person has this subjective feeling of restlessness when you take up too much caffeine you you feel this restlessness so something similar obviously of my, of a much greater magnitude in these patients so they feel this restlessness this this wanting to move so they keep moving they, they keep doing something they'll they'll be moving their hands they'll be moving something in their body because they feel the urge to move not because things are moving by themselves because they feel the urge to move something in their body so if they if they're eating let's say some uh, yogurt they might be they might be wanting to move their hands or their lips or their face or something like this so this is this subjective feeling of restlessness and then we have parkinsonian symptoms parkinsonian symptoms meaning the person might uh, might be having trouble initiating movement rigidity lead pipe rigidity uh, and then we have bradykinesia or less movement so this rigidity and parkinsonian symptoms become characteristic as an adverse effect of a uh, high potency first generation antipsychotics and less commonly low potency first generation antipsychotics and then tardive dyskinesia in which we are in the person has repetitive involuntary movements how do you dis differentiate between tardive dyskinesia and akathisia akathisia is the feeling of restlessness when the person feels the urge to move they want to move something tardive dyskinesia is something is moving by itself the person has no control over it so the imp the timeline becomes important which is why the mnemonic adapt needs to be remembered in the sequence a d a p t ad is acute dystonia it occurs in hours to days ap which is akathisia and parkinsonism starts from days to months and then tardive dyskinesia which occurs from months to years this i've added this example in which this lady can you see the movements of her mandible and her jaw and she's she's not this is moving by herself these are involuntary movements this is an example of tardive dyskinesia yes so we can move on and uh, credits to teddy barksdale from which i uh, took this video so now we can move on with the rest of our table high potency low potency antidopaminergic antidopaminergic but along with that anticholinergic antihistaminergic along with that extrapyramidal symptoms are more common in high potency less common in low potency i'm repeating all of this just so you remember this then anticholinergic effects are more in low potency because as i said as i wrote here that anticholinergic is an aspect of low potency drugs so anticholinergic effects are more common in low potency and anticholinergic effects are less common in high potency so what are anticholinergic effects anti-muscarinic or anticholinergic effects dry as a bone meaning the person will have dry mouth or urinary retention hot as a hair because of decreased salivation parasympathetic innervation functions to increase uh, sorry uh, increase sweating so uh, decreased sweating will cause the person to become really really hot or the temperature to rise blind as a bat because the parasympathetic innervation is responsible for the constriction of your pupil this will cause midriasis or the dilation the person will be blind as a bat they won't be able to see and these this is the toxidrome meaning this is the toxic these are the toxic effect of uh, anticholinergic poisoning so when you talk about adverse effects all of these things to a lesser uh, magnitude unless the person has a toxic dose mad as a hat because of the activation of parasympathetic receptors inside the brain full as a flask due to urinary retention and that these are the anticholinergic effects so all of these again and then finally sedation sedation as a anti histaminergic effect of low potency drugs and less sedation in high potency drugs and now we can move on 
to second generation antipsychotics. We have covered the mode of action and with that we have uh, covered the comparison between the high potency and the low potency and we have named all of these drugs. So now we can move on with the second generation antipsychotics. What's the mode of action? Same as that D2 receptor antagonism but less than first generation antipsychotics and with that we have some uh, serotonin 5-HT2A serotonin receptor antagonism and several other receptors not only this but several other receptors are also involved so besides this second generation antipsychotics and i tried to put a lot of influence on the first when uh, in that table i tried to put a lot of influence that it treats only positive symptoms the first generation treats only positive the second generation because it's two it treats both the positive and the negative because second generation will treat two parts positive and the negative adverse effects they have very prominent metabolic adverse effects like dyslipidemia hyperglycemia and diabetes orthostatic hypotension so when i talked about several other receptors so one of the uh, receptors that they antagonize are the alpha adrenergic receptors or particularly the alpha 1 that cause vasoconstriction so antagoni antagonizing these receptors can predispose the person to developing orthostatic hypotension what is orthostatic hypotension that develops with changes in the position when the person gets up they feel really really they feel like a curtain drawing down in front of their eyes and they feel really dizzy that's an example of orthostatic hypotension yes so anti a1 and anti h1 and then we have clozapine. Clozapine has been linked to decreased neutrophils or decreased granulocytes, which is known as agranulocytosis. Let me remove the markings. Yes, so agranulocytosis and then cardiomyopathy or myocarditis. These are very, very specific effects. So how I remember this is that I remember clozapine, cardiomyopathy and myocarditis and also clozapine closes the bone marrow is how I remember the agranulocytosis. And now the common adverse effects between the first generation and the second generation antipsychotics. Both prolong the QT interval, both cause sedation, both have anticholinergic effects more common in first generation than the second generation, both have extrapyramidal symptoms, extrapyramidal which ones? ABAPT, acute dystonia, akathisia, Parkinsonism, and tardive dyskinesia. But it's more common in the first generation. In that first generation, which type is more common? In the high potency, the extra pyramidal symptoms are more common than, sec uh, than the low potency or the second generation. Hyperprolactinemia. Why hyperprolactinemia? And neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Let's talk about each one of these. Let's talk about hyperprolactinemia and why that occurs. Let's look at the tubero infundibular pathway. I'm really proud of this drawing of the brain that I've made. I, I think I'm really, this is like be my best work. So hypothalamus is connected to your anterior pituitary by a pathway known as the tubero infundibular pathway, which extends from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. Why is that important in this? Because the tubero infundibular pathway is responsible for the tonic secretion of dopamine. Dopamine inhibits prolactin secretion what do antipsychotics do antipsychotics block the action of dopamine on the secretion of uh, on inhibiting prolactin so when i when the uh, instead of the arrow when i have this flat line that means dopamine inhibits prolactin secretion and antipsychotics inhibit the action of dopamine so what will you have you will have an excess of prolactin in your body how will that present that will present as amenorrhea that will present as decreased libido because prolactin decreases the secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Decreased libido, you will have gynecomastia in males and galactorrhea. All of these symptoms. Now you know why hyperprolactinemia occur both in first generation and second generation antipsychotics. That's a common side effects between both of these. Then neuroleptic malignant syndrome. What's neuroleptic malignant syndrome? It's caused by dopamine antagonist. It's characterized by altered mental status, increased sympathetic tone, hyperthermia, hypo, uh, hypertension, 
uh, tachycardia, diaphoresis. Diaphoresis just means increased sweating. Hyperthermia means increased temperatures or temperatures particularly greater than 99.5 uh, Fahrenheit, degree Fahrenheit. Hypertension uh, meaning raised blood pressures. Tachycardia, increased pulse and lead pipe rigidity. So I have a video on neuroleptic malignant syndrome in which I talked about this in considerable detail why when neuroleptic malignant syndrome occurs and uh, how do we treat it and we, I'll talk about all of these in a separate video I'll add a link in, into this description uh, let's start with the summary psychosis has three components delusions hallucinations disorganized thought or speech the first and the second generations of uh, antipsychotics antagonize the D2 receptors in your brain, but along with that, they also antagonize anticholinergic, antihistaminergic, and in, uh, in case of uh, second generation antipsychotics, anti alpha adrenergic receptors as well. Also, second generation antagonizes uh, anti serotonergic receptors, 5 HG2 receptors. Adverse effects include extrapyramidal symptoms, hyperprolactinemia neuroleptic malignant syndrome and for which I have made a complete video I'll add the link anticholinergic and antihistaminergic effects besides that second generation antipsychotics also causes metabolic side effects that's all for antipsychotics uh, thank you so much for tuning in and if you want to see uh, any other of my videos you can go to my channel subscribe to my channel if you want to stay tuned in and press the bell icon thank you